uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Barry Barish from Caltech, uh, the Nobel Prize winner for the gravitational wave uh, discovery, and he will talk about understanding our universe with gravitational waves. Okay, good morning. For me, that's the reason I'm dark is it's early morning in California. Well, let me try to put my slides up. Okay. okay. Slides up, visible. Yes. Okay. Visible and full screen. Okay. 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 I'm going to talk about uh, you know the same subject matter from but from the point of view of gravitational waves and their detection. Uh, the um, sources that we look at, I summarize on this uh, picture here on this slide. Uh, everything you've heard so far is actually the first bullet. So I'm going to concentrate today on the first bullet, which is compact binaries, which is all that we've uh, been able to detect uh, so far. We do a lot of work and we're prepared to do the other subjects that I name here, the other topics. Uh, uh, of course, we monitor and look for a supernova all the time. There hasn't been one close enough for us to detect. Uh, we anticipate, um, or I do anyway, that the most likely next class of sources we might see are pulsars. We're quite sensitive. Uh, it's a computing problem that keeps us from being more sensitive to look for pulsars. Uh, the main problem in looking for pulsars is the ones that we know a lot about are old and uh, probably are more spherically symmetrical by that point and have a smaller gravitational wave signal. But our sensitivity uh, continues to get better and better to look for periodic sources. Uh, of course, we look for cosmological signals. That's very difficult at high frequencies where we are. And lastly, uh, we look for what we believe may be true, and that is that there are sources that we will see that uh, don't give, other than black holes, uh, that don't give uh, electromagnetic radiation, or at least haven't been observed. But I'll concentrate on the first. So, um, uh, so I'm going to talk about the detection of gravitational waves from compact uh, binaries. Uh, there's three possibilities uh, from at least known sources: uh, the uh, merger of two, a pair of neutron stars, the merger of a pair of black holes, or the merger of a black hole neutron star. Uh, uh, pair. And uh, we have observed all three at this point, and so I'll talk about uh, a little bit about all of them. The search technique that we use, I'm going to mention first, which is match templates. Uh, the idea that we have to be able to pull a gravitational wave signal out of a substantial background noise and get to as much sensitivity as we can is. Um, um, the um, idea or the technique of match filtering. With match filtering, uh, as shown in the right-hand upper curve, uh, you can actually uh, pull a, a signal that's not visible, that's smaller than noise level, by, by multiplying the product of the noise and the known shape signal. In our case, the known shape signal is then templates which we calculate in advance using general relativity. And uh, we populate the uh, kinematic region available to us, which is shown in the lower left. Um, in the three colors, the, the top one is the black hole mergers. And uh, those are, are uh, the little triangles and squares are just some indication of a few that we've seen to indicate to you that where we look and where we see them tends to be somewhat different. They, the ones that we're seeing are much higher in mass and more or less limited by our kinematic range than we initially expected or in where we search. The lower right hand is, of course, black hole neutron stars. There I'll show you 
uh, at least first examples. And the lower left is the, the, the uh, region, kinematic region for neutron star, neutron stars. We populate this with several hundred thousand templates, all calculated in detail in advance using uh, uh, Einstein's equations. And in the, in the region near uh, convergence, we use numerical relativity. So the technique can be illustrated here where, where you see the signal, uh, where you see the signal in the noise and a, uh, a signal comes out where uh, the little spike is when you actually multiply the two times each other. And that's the technique that we have uh, used. This is the picture from actually the first event because it's a good illustration of the ish of the first uh, point, and that is the signals that we see, and I'll just show one in detail, are very much like the calculations from Einstein's equations. The top plat panels are the actual observations of the very first event in two detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, one in Livingston, Louisiana. So the first thing to note is they look very similar to each other, except maybe the colors. Uh, the uh, second panel down is the calculations after uh, fitting the parameters of the of Einstein's equations, and you'll notice they look very much alike, and that's with no uh, nothing else done to them. If you subtract one from the other, you get the third panel, which is the residual noise. And so, what to no notice then is the signals that we have are a random residual noise. There's no patterns. Uh, plus Einstein's equations, and that fits the data very well. And that's true of all our uh, events. The events characteristically are different because the kinematics are different, uh, the masses are different, and the distances are different, and so forth. But uh, that's it. On the very bottom is the time frequency distribution. And you notice the time scale is only for this a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second that we observe the last couple tenths of a second of the merger of two, uh, two objects. That time gets much longer for the neutron star case, as I'll show you. So what is seen compared to the typical sensitivity curves that you, that you see in our um, uh, publications is shown on the left. The, the left hand shows the, the so-called noise curves. You'll notice the scale is 10 to the minus 22, 10 to the minus 23, that's our sensitivity, you probably have heard that we can measure one part in 10 to the 21, so the signal has to stand up uh, above that. We're pretty close to 10 to the 22 now. And depending on the masses of the objects, they go out to a certain frequency, and that's the highest frequency. So the three examples shown on the left uh, have many wiggles or a few wiggles or lots and lots of wiggles, depending on the masses. If the masses are lighter, they go to higher frequency and they, uh, we detect them from the frequency threshold that we have, which is tens of hertz to hundreds of hertz or thousands of hertz or up to 10,000 were sensitive, but black holes, of course, don't go that high. The data itself then can be fit and much is extracted, much is extractable from the shape uh, of the waveform. So if you look at the shape of the waveform, it's what we call a chirp signal. Uh, the chirp mass can be written down by the formula that, that I show in the upper right. There's a second term, but I uh, didn't include that in, in, the, in, the, in the slide. Uh, and then that's fit to the data. From that, we can extract an incredible amount of information, essentially everything about the event from uh, the the amplitude, the masses, this even the spins, the, whether there's <laughs> precession. Uh, we need multiple to measurements of this to do sky location, <clears throat> but we have sky location, the distance by the amplitude that's measured, and so forth. So this is just a, a sweep of a few of the events to see that show you that they all look different from each other. But in some, they give us then the distribution of black hole masses, again, shown in this plot here. The tendency is that we 
detect heavy ones. Of course, that's a combination of the fact that we there are more heavy ones than we first had anticipated. Uh, but it's also the fact that heavy ones give a bigger signal and that's uh, easier to see in a gravitational wave detector. The uh, signals then can be taken, and this is just a, a long one to show you, and we look at the different pieces of them in detail and compare it with, uh, the, um, uh, with the equations of Einstein, so to test general relativity. And doing that, we get a series of measurements of the parameters of Einstein's equations. I'm not gonna talk about that in detail for two reasons today. One is this is an astronomy meeting, but the second is that everything we see so far to, every, to all the accuracy we have agrees with uh, general relativity. And in fact, we can look for deviations, for example, if we include a graviton as a, as a massive object that puts dispersion in the equations, uh, the dispersion doesn't fit well if the mass is finite. And so we set a limit on the mass, which is quite small, which is indicated on the bottom. And uh, the difficulty that we have, and just to indicate to you, is this doesn't mean that in detail, uh, general relativity as formed by Einstein is the correct formulation, but it's the only one that's, that's developed to the detail where we can compare details of what we detect with the, um, e with the equations. So the way we look for alternatives to Einstein is maybe unsatisfying, but it's all we can do now. We look for deviations from Einstein's equations rather than how will we fit Einstein's versus a, variation, a variant of general relativity. We hope that general relativity will be developed more theoretically where we can directly compare how well our data fits other alternatives. But at present, we do it by only putting limits on how well we do we fit Einstein's equations. We've now detected quite a few events uh, through our data runs, which we call observ observational run one, two, and I show three A, half of it here. And what to note is two things. One is that as we have increase the sensitivity of the detector or the volume of the universe that we look at in the left-hand plot, the number of events, just the number of events that we've accumulated follows pretty well linearly the increase in volume. As we increase the volume, of course, we're going to higher redshifts. And so we see no indication so far of any uh, physical um, effects that change the where uh, the density of these in the range that we look at. However, we're at quite low Z at this point. In the upper right hand, and I won't go through the phenomenology, uh, we, I plot the examples, I think all 80 or 90 that we've detected. Uh, the masses for, oh, the mass in solar mass units in the, on the right and the kinematics on the left. And you see the population of these, uh, of these events. And we're using that to try to understand better the origin of the events. Where did, what created these black hole events? Did they come from uh, the uh, stellar, uh, from stellar events, the collapse of making the black holes? Did they come by some dynamical me mechanism or do they even possibly come primordially? So looking at these kind of distributions now, uh, we're accumulating enough statistics to, to start to differentiate uh, whether there's uh, spins, whether the spins are correlated, uh, what the mass distribution's like, what the mass distribution um, is, is like in terms of uh, the uh, relative masses of the two and so forth. So that's more or less the status of the black hole one. Uh, let me go on to uh, talk then about the next one. Once we talk about other than black holes, there's the possibility that the same mergers can be observed electromagnetically. 
So let me introduce that and then I'll show you where we are. Uh, first, uh, there's a lot of talk about what's called multi-messenger astronomy. So this is using uh, electromagnetic, in principle, electromagnetic signals, gravitational wave signals, and neutrinos from the same source. If we do that, uh, then we get the power of the different physics of all three. And of course, for electromagnetic uh, interactions, astronomy has benefited tremendously in recent decades by the fact that it is looked at over multi-wavelengths now, not just what Galileo and times after that did by looking at the optical uh, band. Now we want to do all three, if you can, eventually. Uh, we're just barely able to do this at all at this point because of the limited uh, sensitivity. But neutrinos have been seen a couple different events. One, a supernova, another a recent event from the South Pole, along with electromagnetic radiation. And we've observed what I'll show you, a gravitational wave event, along with electromagnetic. So, one can look at doing this in the future and I'll project that a little bit. In order to do that, we have to do more than detect gravitational waves. We have to tell where they came from to enough accuracy so that the uh, electromagnetic uh, instruments can point to the same region in the sky. That's mean, That requires three sensitive uh, detectors at the same time in order to do that as indicated on this picture. The second thing, that has to be done. So that requires three sensitive detectors running at the same time. Uh, the, sensit the reliability of gravitational wave detectors at present is about 80%. So 80% of the time, the gravitational wave detector in Washington or Virgo is up. So for all three to be up, it's 0.8 then cubed. And so the likelihood that all three is up at the same time is less than 50%. That'll get better, but obviously it's very difficult. They have to become very reliable, which they're not yet. Uh, the second thing is that we have to tell where it came from. That's fine, but reliably and quickly. And to do it quickly means that we have to know with reliability that we saw a gravitational wave event uh, quickly. And uh, that's indicated in this picture here. We take the signals from the three detectors uh, we calculate that we saw an event, determine its sky location. Uh, then we have to validate that it really was right and, uh, and announce it to electromagnetic facilities fast enough so they can uh, turn and point themselves at where the event is. That has to be done in minutes. And uh, it's quite a challenge to actually not only detect gravitational wave events, but not have to falsely have too many mistakes and uh, to be reliable enough to even understand it well enough to know where it came from and to have all three detectors working. So it's quite a challenge. We then, after we announce it, do our more detailed analysis, which can take hours or weeks uh, before we uh, get the results. And about 20% of the time, we have to say that we've made a mistake and about 20% of the events we miss on these quick uh, events, but we're doing quite well at the present time. The first and the detection, of course, that was made was a neutron star merger shown in this plot here. The bottom left is the time frequency of the, of the uh, gravitational wave signal. The upper three bands above that are the detections of the gamma ray bursts, and you'll notice the gamma ray burst signal is 1.7 seconds after the gravitational wave signal. 1.7 seconds, we can't know what it should be exactly, but the gravitational wave signal comes from the dynamics of the, of the gra uh, merger itself, while the, uh, the, the gamma ray burst signal comes from the nuclear physics once they've merged, so there's some expected time in between. However, what's impressive is that within 1.7 seconds, they, they, and they may be even much less than that, they arrive at the same time. That's the, this event was 150 million light years away, which is 10 to the, more than 10 to the 15 seconds, which means that the speed of light 
and the speed of gravitational waves has been demonstrated by this observation to be the same to one part in 10 to the 15, which is what we expect it to be the same by Einstein, but this is a simple demonstration that in the first event, we determined that they, it is the same. That event was then followed by looking at all the different wavelengths, uh, even out to the radio at the end. That put together gives a, uh, an emission curve, which fits very well a model for the neutron star merger, which is called a kilonova. I don't have time today to go through that, but it fits the model quite nicely that the merger is a, a neutron star, is a kilonova. But this demonstrates very well that by doing this multi-messenger astronomy and the merger, one of them only telling you that it's consistent with a kilonova, that we can begin to understand the physics of these, the merger of these two very compact objects. And so we can look at understanding the equation of state, for example. Um, we have some limits on that now uh, for the neutron stars. The uh, same event was also useful because we could identify which galaxy it came from in determining, uh, once we knew the distance, in determining the Hubble constant. So even on one event, we determined the Hubble constant in the in this observation, and it's consistent, but of course with bigger errors being only one event to the two values which are in tension with each other for the Hubble constant. Uh, we can look forward to either they resolving this tension in the next few years, or us accumulating enough data that by a very different technique that we may help with this problem, but it'll take more like 100 events, not one event, to be able to get a, a very high precision on the Hubble constant from gravitational waves. But the, the, the systematics are completely different. Um, we will improve quite rapidly, and that's why I'm emphasizing this subject. There's two new interferometers that will exist by the mid-2020s, plus substantial improvements in the existing ones. There'll be LIGO, where you're building a detector in India, which will, is under construction and will be complete and operational by 2025. It should be the best of the LIGO interferometers when it turns on because we can spend our time uh, on, the, on the technical issues of making it work rather than taking data, which we spend much of our time with on LIGO. So it should work quite well on that time scale. And uh, lastly, in Japan, they're commissioning now a uh, innovative detector that uses cryogenics to go to low temperatures. So with five detectors working, our ability to point in the sky will improve dramatically. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, you see the, the one event that I showed you, we were happened to be very lucky. Uh, the event was in the region where these uh, little curves are very small, and we determined where it was quite accurately. But for much of the globe, we don't, much of the directions we don't with only th the three detectors in the locations they're in. By 2024, 2025, we'll be in the lower left-hand corner and any observation anywhere in the sky at that point, we should be able to identify to tens, hopefully a few tens, uh, square, <coughs> square degrees, and at that point, it should be very, very useful for uh, astronomers. Uh, this is the uh, uh, first observations of black hole neutron star mergers, which we announced this last spring. Uh, and uh, again, we've now seen all three. This, we have looked at details, which I won't go through today, of tidal effects and so forth. But again, it's just the first indication of a couple events. We should start to see many more soon. The last thing I'd like, physics-wise, I'd like to just highlight is that we now have almost 100 examples of gravitational wave events, mostly black hole mergers. We are basically uh, uh, concentrating on what we call the exceptional events, the ones that don't initially fit the position, the expectations that 
we might have. We know that based on one or two events, the problem can be experimental, or it may be a hint of something real. So I'll just share with you some of what we see. We see events, a couple events actually, that have signals that are between, that have reconstructed masses that are between neutrars and black holes, too light to be black holes and too heavy to be neutron stars. I show here an example, which is more than five sigma from the distribution of neutron star uh, combined pair neutron star masses, which is 2.75, and this comes out closer to almost four. Uh, and so we have this example that uh, may or may, may be experimental, or it may be real, we can't tell on one event, but we may, we have first the sensitivity to look, and we are even have some population of an event between uh, the um, neutron star, heaviest neutron star mass that we expect and the lowest black hole mass. Similarly, we have an event with high uh, uh, asymmetry, that is a factor of almost 10 between the mass of one object, the mass of the mass of the other object. That's very useful for us understanding the relativity issues because it's very almost impossible and difficult to calculate the uh, numerical relativity when the mass ratio gets very high. We also have problems with spin. So those uh, getting experimental information is very important in us learning. But in the case of the big difference that we saw, it again comes out that the secondary mass is 2.6 times the mass of the sun which is in the same mass gap that I talked about. So the, I think you can look forward to the future where we explore whether there really are objects that are landings for some reason in between the mass of the neutron stars and the mass of black holes. On the other end, we're seeing uh, events that are in, uh, on the surface too heavy. And that is we have a mer the heaviest one is we have several, but the heaviest one is shown here, a merger between an 85 solar mass black hole and a 66 solar mass black hole, giving 142 solar masses. Uh, that's the, so the signal is very clear, but the masses are so heavy that this barely is detectable in LIGO because it doesn't get to very high frequency. So the signal looks like I'm showing here which looks a lot different than this. It's seen in all three detectors uh, physically, but it looks different than the signals that you see with the, ins with the uh, chirp-like in spiral that you're used to. That's because it's the very end of it. So we believe that what's being seen is the final merger part and not the, the final coalescence and not the merger before that. However, we can't be sure so since the signal looks different, we, it isn't as definitive that what we're actually seeing is a black hole in that, in that sense. And so there is also the possibility that there's other uh, alternatives to the physics, which I won't go through in detail. We can look forward to rapid um, improvements and increases in what we'll be reporting from LIGO and Virgo. And that's because the, of the fact that uh, these detectors are limited by us, not physics. If you think of the LHC, the, the uh, detection of the Higgs boson is a couple percent effect, which was seen remarkably and wonderfully in 2011 to say that the Higgs had been discovered. But it's been very hard to go very far beyond that using this huge, powerful accelerator because 98% of what you see is background. And so you're looking at a 2% effect with a physics background underneath. In our case, the background that limits us is not physics, it's technical. So in the gravitational wave detectors, we're limited by the shaking of the earth, we're limited by electronic noise, we're limited by how, much, how many photons we have in our uh, uh, lasers. And so we can improve, as we can solve the technical problems, we can improve the sensitivity. As we improve the sensitivity linearly, it improves the event rate 
by the cube because that's a much further outlook. So we can rapidly increase the rate, which is what's happened. If you look at the right-hand curve, the, the last part of the panel is the expected rate for the next uh, run, which we should uh, uh, start next summer. We lost uh, almost a year because of the pandemic, but we'll start next summer. And uh, that will be an event of some sort every couple of days. So only three years, four years ago, we saw the first gravitational event and we'll be up to where we're seeing an, almost an event a day uh, by next year. Uh, this uh, isn't the end of the story. We'll keep improving the rate of these detectors toward, through this, this coming uh, decade. Uh, but then we'll be limited by what we can do with the present interferometers. So there's a lot of work on uh, going on on the design of what would be a next generation gravitational wave signal uh, detector. I'll just indicate that there's uh, this is the one in the US, which you maybe haven't heard as much about, but this would be building it on the Earth's surface, but making the arms 40 kilometers instead of four kilometers. Uh, staying with the L-shaped form and making it cryogenic eventually, which solves many noise problems to get sensitivity. And the, the theme here is to get it on the Earth's surface where it's much cheaper uh, so that we can build multiple detectors for a next generation like we have now to do multi-messenger astronomy. The approach in Europe is different. It's to build an ultimately sensitive detector deep underground uh, the Einstein telescope. Uh, it's uh, uh, the arms are less than the one I showed, but a triangle formulation, 10 kilometers, and much of the same technical features uh, otherwise, but basically where it, there's six interferometers going clockwise and counterclockwise around this. Uh, what this will enable us to do once you go to the shown here is the sensitivity of the last uh, data run, what the sensitivity of the next LIGO run in the middle and later in this decade, and then what can be done with Cosmic Explorer, the American uh, third generation detector. Similarly, but a slightly different shape would be the Einstein telescope. Uh, they go way down. What does that enable you to do? It enables you to see, for example, the black hole events that we see out to the edge of the universe or at a high redshift. Everything that we've done so far has a very small redshift. And what will be enabled in the future is to start doing high redshift astrophysics or really the beginning of doing cosmology with gravitational waves. And that'll be possible in the future, not in the next few years, but as we develop a next generation detector but the path is clear to do that if there's money and so forth. But technically we know how to go to detectors that would be sensitive enough to do this. Uh, that enables you to go to high redshift as I show here. I just, in the end, just wanna point out that just like in astronomy, it's completely feasible to do multi-wavelength uh, gravitational wave physics that's being approached already with a detector in space and uh, um, um, uh, pulsar uh, detection arrays that go to even lower frequency. So the pulsar arrays are to look at signals from known pulsars from all over and look at the very carefully with good systematics at any deviations from the very good clocks that you have there. And the systematic errors are the big problem in, in doing this. So, uh, that I think I've run out of time ends what I wanted to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent talk. Uh, we already have a few questions, so I will start with the one from Chris Belczynski. Uh, he asks, uh, do the observation indicate an increasing binary black hole merger rate? Uh, we don't, but that's a very good question. Uh, and I can't say the answer is no. We just don't have enough range in redshift to, to answer that question. Of course, what's behind that is to try to understand the origin of these black holes. And uh, there's maybe three general candidates. One is that 
they uh, and why they're so heavy. And one is maybe there there's some dynamical uh, mechanism, like the some um, dynamical mechanism, or maybe they're primordial, or maybe there's regions that are low metallicity that allow these. And so there's different models. Uh, we just don't cover enough yet. Uh, redshift to make any conclusions at all. That graph I showed with masses was a, is the first attempt to do that, but we have, we're just unable to really um, show any, any deviations or changes as a function of redshift at this point. And that's our limitations, not whether there is any effects. Okay, thank you. Another question is from Radek Poleski. Uh, do you think that uh, gravitational wave detectors will be able to measure masses of the most massive neutron stars and hence constrain the equation of state in the next few years? I, I hope so. I mean, I, I, as I showed, the, prob the problem is that uh, we, there's less neutron stars that we can detect partially because they're lighter. Uh, than what we've detected. And we need to, to do that well, to do anything well. We need to get uh, a good signals of those. So they have to be reasonably close. The neutron, we detected more than the one neutron star case, but that one was close enough that we could measure it in detail. So I think it's again, be a little patient. I don't know that we'll be able to make a lot of progress on that in the very next run, which will be an improvement of maybe a factor of three in rate over where we were last time. Uh, but I think in this decade, we should be able to do the neutron equation of state quite quantitatively. I mean, there's a direct path to doing that. Thank you. Uh, another another question, question from Bojana Czerny. Could you comment on the Chinese project, the Tian Qin project? for studying gravitational waves from the space? Sure. Uh, first, the, the Chinese, the Chinese uh, have more than one project. Uh, I don't know, they don't have a try, they don't have the same kind of mechanisms in place that we do in Europe or in the US in choosing between projects, so I don't know what'll happen, whether the final decisions will be made from the Academy of Sciences or what, but they have one project, which is basically a LISA-like project, uh, not substantially different. And the second one, which is I find more interesting, is in the, will be in the mass gap between where LIGO can detect, which is down to 10 Hertz or so, and where LISA detects starting at 10 to the minus two hertz. That's a very quiet region in between. And so a detector that is in between will then give continuous coverage from high frequencies uh, to low frequencies. The Japanese also have a proposal to put a uh, gravitational wave detector in space that would be in this in-between region. I, I don't know in either case, neither is funded and I don't know in either case whether they will be. Thank you. Another question from Radek Poleski. Uh, to what temperature will be, uh, will Kagra and future detectors be cooled down? Ah, that's a very good question. They, if I knew the answer to where you should cool down, we would do it sooner. The, the problem is that when we cool, we, cooling is an obvious big step in making more sensitive gravitational wave detectors because the Brownian motion in the mirrors themselves is a big issue. However, the mirrors themselves are a limiting issue, even on, on LIGO, say now. The material we use is fused silica and having a, a coating that makes it reflective that we use now is not a, perfect match to the characteristics of the few silica. And because of that, some of our limitations in the frequency ranges that you look at are due to, let's say, deficiencies in the mirrors. They're not perfect. And we know a lot about making mirrors that we use at room temperature. They're used for super mirrors for astronomy and so forth. 
if we cool to low temperature, the big question is what, what material do you make the mirror out of? It's no longer fusilica. What material do you make the mirror out of? And then what material do you use to coat it to make it reflective? The Japanese have taken a leap by just going to sapphire, which is um, uh, an obvious choice. You can make a good mirror, a good um, casting for the mirror. And uh, then you have to go to very low temperature. We're looking at using, for example, a crystalline silicon, a single, single crystal, single uh, grown silica, which would be higher temperature. But if we use that, then the, what the question of what the surface, what the best reflectors are, is unclear. So in the, in the U.S. at least, there's the NSF is now supporting a multi-university uh, R&D program to look at the um, uh, materials and material science and reflectability to make uh, mirrors that would be optimum at low temperature. Since we're limited by the mirrors with all we know at high temperature, at the room temperature, it's really important to not just go to low temperature, but to do it uh, to do it as well as we can right. Unfortunately, condensed matter physics is not as fundamental as maybe what we tend to do in say particle physics or, or what we're doing in gravitational waves. And so it's quite empirical. So we can't rely on theory to tell us somehow what's the right material. We have to do a lot of laboratory R&D and that's going on now. And I, I would hope that in this cause we can be optimistic and hope that that might be done where we have uh, can go to low temperature reliably in the next decade or it might take a little bit longer. Thank you. There is one more question from uh, Chris Belczynski. Uh, do you think that black hole masses discovered by LIGO and Virgo are higher than expected? Because they are higher than the black uh, uh, than the masses of black holes in the Milky Way. Yes, they're higher than expected, even considering the fact that our sensitivity is best for massive objects. So we have a bias in gravitational wave detectors to, um, to, to be more sensitive to higher masses, but not really at the level of the distributions that are, we're, we're getting. So there is a, a phenomenon that the masses we believe are higher, uh, tend to be higher than was thought before there were gravitation, considerably higher than we thought when there was gravitational wave detectors. I can't be very quantitative yet because we're just getting the distributions and then have to differentiate those from the bias. So I showed one plot that showed that we're starting to get mass distributions, but we have to understand our sensitivity as a function of mass and uh, uh, compare that. And quantitatively, we just don't have enough data to do that yet, except the qualitative statement that what you asked is true. There is, there are more than we expected as a function of mass. Okay, thank you. And one more, more question. Uh, this one from Agnieszka Janiuk. Can you comment what are the prospects for multiband gravitational wave observations by future missions, LISA uh, and Einstein telescope? Will they reach cosmological distances? Uh, that's another good question. Everything that we're doing is aimed at hoping that that will be true, but it relies on on two things. One is uh, LISA and its time scale, combined with getting to a next generation gravitational wave detectors on the on the Earth on the same time scale. So we have time scales as scientists that we talk about uh, building something like the Einstein telescope. But people should recognize the Einstein telescope is last numbers I heard is $2 billion. That's not a small project, except for, for projects, I don't know, inside CERN or something, that's very, very large. It's not funded yet. Uh, at, at, if, we're, if we take the technically driven possibility, including being able to solve the cryogenic problems, by the mid 2030s, we could have, no, there's no reason we couldn't have a sensitive Einstein telescope or cosmic explorer in the US 
built by the mid 2030s, which is the time when the when the uh, Einstein when the uh, space telescope Lisa will will fly. It's important that they both be at the same time, and that uh, is a lot of what's driving the plans for a third generation detector. But people have to recognize that we're we don't have engineering designs, we don't have some of the technical problems solved, and uh, it'll be it'll take a lot of advances and support to be able to get a, a third generation detector if the space detectors stay on that time scale. Okay, I think we have run out of questions. So you, you have answered them all. Yeah, and we are more or less at the time where we should finish the session. So I would like to thank you again for, uh, for this excellent talk and the discussion. And I would like to thank all the speakers uh, during this session as well. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.